Hello, and welcome to our module on propositional logic for Foundations of Computer Science. This is the first part of the module, and we will begin with motivations and applications. Try to describe some of the reasons you might study propositional logic and what it is useful for. Uh, then I'll move on to introducing the syntax. This is something I think you're probably familiar with, but we'll just cover the rules for how you can form expressions and statements in propositional logic. After that, I'll cover semantics. This is how you assign truth values to your statements. And then from there, we'll move into these concepts of validity and satisfiability. And these are sort of recurring ideas that will come up in all of the kinds of logic that we look at in this course. Finally, we'll look at what we call normal forms. These are standard ways of writing formulas in a restricted syntax that is more convenient for some reason. So typically we find them to be easier to analyze or uh, more amenable to automated analysis. That's it for this part, but to give you a preview of what's ahead, the second part of this module will cover two decision procedures for validity in propositional logic. And in order for these to make sense, we also need to cover what a decision procedure is. And so that's a pretty big topic uh, it could be its own course uh, if we if we had the time. So we're just going to attempt to give a brief sketch so you have enough information to have a working familiarity with the concept so the second part of this module makes sense. That will happen in kind of an interlude between parts one and two. In that interlude, what we'll attempt to do is say a little bit about what a decision procedure is and uh, how this idea is related to computability and computational complexity. So again, for this video, our aims are very modest. I'm just going to sketch out a few of the ways that we can use propositional logic, and hopefully this will help motivate our study of it. So what can we actually do with propositional logic? Obviously, this will not be a comprehensive list, but generally speaking, propositional logic gives you a way to express assertions precisely and also to examine consistency among those assertions. Additionally, propositional logic can be used to justify simplifications, uh, usually by showing the equivalence of different expressions. And slightly less general, but also a very well-known concrete application of propositional logic is modeling combinational circuits. And this is something that we will take a look at later on. To illustrate what I mean by expressing and examining assertions, I have cooked up a simple example in which I ask you to imagine that you are responsible for writing some code that automates sending emails to customers of some company. And so in this scenario, uh, there is a marketing meeting in which we adopt some policies. First, uh, it is decided that within some given period of time that if we do not send a customer a bill, we send them an advertisement. And somebody is concerned, maybe in the meeting, that the customers will complain that they're getting too much email. So we also add the policy that if we are sending a bill or an advertisement, then we do not send a survey. And then finally, I imagine that our survey team is saying, hey, wait, you know, we said we were sending advertisements if we don't send bills, but we don't say what we're doing about surveys. And so we say, or okay, we'll add this rule. If we don't send a bill, we will send a survey. And so these three policies are written down and transmitted to you, and you're asked to write some code that implements them. Now, you could take the approach, of course, of just writing each statement as some conditional, but it would also be nice if there was some way of figuring out what all these statements mean together and what they say we should actually do. In other words, is there a way to express our policy more clearly? Now, a way we could approach this is to assign a variable to each of our basic statements. We say, let B denote we send a bill, let A denote we send an advertisement, and let S denote we send a survey. These variables are called propositional variables, and we can use them to rewrite our claims as formulas. So when we do that, our three facts become not P implies A, B or A implies not S, and not B implies S. Just to be very clear about how these relate to our original statements, I will rewrite them. Say not B implies A, that's if we don't send a bill, then we're sending an advertisement, that's not B implies A. And uh, if we send a bill, or an advertisement, that's this formula here, then 
we don't send a survey, so not survey. And finally, uh, if we don't send a bill, not bill, then we do send a survey. That's not B implies S. Now, one thing we can do since there are not too many variables is just write out the truth table for these statements to see what's going on. So if we do that, what we see is that there are actually not too many ways of making all the statements true at once. In fact, we have just two options, our second row and our fourth row. These are the two rows where we have ones or true for all of our statements after we write out all the possibilities. Finding values that satisfy all of our statements at the same time is called satisfying our set of statements. And in this case, it gives us some insight into what's going on. We can see in the two rows in which our set of statements is satisfied, B is true in both and S is false in both. So we can say that these statements can be satisfied if and only if B is true and S is false. And on the other hand, uh, A can be either true or false, depending on which row we're in. So if we go back to our initial scenario, you might think that this indicates perhaps something is wrong with our policy because we are now sending a bill all the time and we are never sending a survey. This may not be what we wanted to do and perhaps that was not immediately obvious from our initial statements of policy. That said, even though this policy turned out maybe not to be what we intended, uh, it's not the worst case scenario because it's at least possible to implement it. Um, that's not always true. So for example, uh, say we were to notice the fact that we are sending bills all the time and never sending surveys and try to correct for it by adding this new policy that says if we don't send a survey, we don't send a bill. If we do that, what happens is we end up with a bigger problem. Our four facts become not bill implies advertisement. So if no bill, then send an advertisement. Bill or advertisement implies not survey and not bill implies survey and then also no survey implies no bill. Altogether, these statements form a set that can't be satisfied at all. What that means is there is no assignment that makes them all true at the same time. And so we say these assertions are inconsistent. To see what I mean by this, we can again take a look at the truth table. And you can see if we now listed all four of our statements, that in each case, we have some situation for every assignment of variables, we have some situation where one of these statements has to be false. So what this means is there's no possible assignment in which all of these statements are true at the same time, which means any given assignment will violate at least one of our policies. So we now have an even bigger problem than we had before, which is that our policy can no longer be implemented at all, and we have to drop at least one of these statements. Now, another thing you might have noticed during the course of this example is that our truth table suggests our original three statements are considerably more complicated than they need to be. And in fact, we could write them more succinctly simply as B and not S since this produces an equivalent constraint. This is another application I mentioned, which is to use propositional logic to justify simplifications. And it's important enough to get its own example, so consider the following conditional statement. If A is less than B, or A is greater than or equal to B, and C is equal to D. This conditional can be simplified to the statement if A is less than B, or C is equal to D. But to give us some confidence that these two statements are equivalent and that they produce the same result, we can use propositional logic. In particular, we can assign propositional variables P and Q to the statements A is less than B and C is equal to D, respectively. And if we substitute these back into our original formula, we get P and Q here. Now note that the negation of the statement A is less than B is A is greater than or equal to B. So if we're representing this statement with a P, we can represent A is greater than or equal to B as not P. So the final statement we end up with then is P or not P and Q. And our simplification turns out to be justified by the fact that P or not P and Q is equivalent to the statement P or Q as propositional logic will allow you to show. Just in case this is a new symbol, I'll draw attention to the fact that we're using these three horizontal bars here to mean 
logically equivalent to. This and the previous example covers the applications I mentioned about expressing assertions precisely, examining consistency, and justifying simplifications. The last application I mentioned is modeling combinational circuits, and this is very straightforward and we can illustrate it easily by looking at the circuit diagram of a half adder. So here we have three kinds of gates that take as input one or two binary values and implement the logical operators AND, OR, and NOT. We're labeling the inputs bit 1 and bit 2, but we could also just as easily call them P and Q, and they will function just like propositional variables. The value of our sum and carry bits in our output can be expressed as propositional formulas where the carry bit is true when bit 1 and bit 2 are true, and the sum bit is true when either of those bits are true, but not both. I'll leave it as an exercise for you to verify that this is in fact the behavior that we want from a half adder. That concludes all the applications I'm going to show you right now. Uh, there are of course many others, including some that have some surprisingly deep connections to open problems in computer science. Hopefully we can touch on this a little bit later in the course, but for now, I think this is probably enough to give some idea of why propositional logic is a relevant thing for a computer scientist to study.